that was a very good introduction by uh, Andre. And uh, I would strongly encourage anybody listening to this live or recording to go back to uh, the first um, session that was on tomatoes. Um, in terms of insects, there are similarities, especially when you're talking about sting bugs and caterpillars. Uh, they also get on aphids and whiteflies. They get, get on tomatoes, they get on, on cucurbits. So uh, uh, watch those. And some of this information may look repetitive, but it's intentionally done so. So make sure you familiarize yourself uh, and uh, uh, especially take good pictures uh, when you're confused. Um, take good pictures and send it to David or Andre or me, and we, we try to diagnose insects um, constantly, so or any problem uh, whatsoever. But uh, I have my information online. Uh, you can find me on numerous publications. I did post uh, some Zoom links, um, uh, some um, aces.edu blog links in the chat. Uh, we have the IPM newsletter. Don't forget to sign up for that. You can read more about Andre's research, uh, David's articles, and, and uh, IPM information through that newsletter. That's a statewide newsletter, uh, as well as uh, subscribing to what David is sending out. So that's very critical to stay in touch with the uh, extension office in your county, wherever you are. Uh, also, we uh, just before logging in to this session, I was mentioning about the Farming Basics phone app. Uh, we are going to launch uh, on the new version, phase two, uh, within a month, hopefully. And that will have a lot of resources for producers and gardeners. Uh, for example, there will be a, we have added the weeds section in there with pictures, but there's also links to uh, our social media channels, online course, everything will be on your fingertips. It's a very nice looking app. So if you have the Farming Basics phone app, uh, you should get a notification or, uh, automatically. Uh, I also like to mention that, you know, besides these resources, just wanted to mention our funding sources. Um, you know, we are funded through a large number of grants, and those are very critical to our success and our team's success, and especially uh, our specialty crops block grants uh, from Department for Agriculture. So just wanted to thank everybody that supports this research and the industry that helps. Uh, did that change, David, on your screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So again, those are your resources. Uh, we are going to start our Alabama virtual farm tours tomorrow and Harley Willis coordinates that project. Uh, so you have to subscribe to the uh, Alabama Extension Commercial Hot page to see it. And then our monthly webinars go on. So these this vegetable school in is in addition to the monthly webinars. So lots of learning opportunities, guys. So don't miss out. Uh, watch the recordings on the digital archive. Now, uh, just wanted to uh, also tell you that if you have the phone app, Farming Basics phone app, you can access these videos um, through the phone app. And these are some of the videos that I've, uh, one is more recent that talks about the three levels of pest management. It's a, almost a 10 minute overview uh, of all the pest management systems, especially from sustainable ag uh, perspective. So if you're interested, check out uh, these videos and then there's also a trap crop video. There's actually two uh, of those online. Those are slightly old, but they're still relevant. Uh, and make sure you have the 2022 Southeast Vegetable Handbook. If you're watching recordings, um, make sure you have the latest year's uh, handbook. Uh, don't use the old handbooks, uh, especially with insecticide listings. They change some years um, and there could be pretty significant changes. We have also updated the organic vegetable IPM slide chart, which is a, a very basic tool, but a very critical tool for farmers and uh, gardeners, especially if you're a beginning farmer. These tools will be handy for you. If you need these, uh, and we also have the Urban Farm IPM toolkit. If you need them, please email me and we'll uh, try to mail this out or come to a extension meeting and get them yourself. So uh, multiple ways you can get them, but make sure you have the resources. Now, jumping into the insect world uh, after the introduction that Andre gave, so you will see the connection. Uh, of course, I uh, you know uh, uh, it's very critical to have healthy plants. If you have a sick plant, it's a calling card for insects. So um, just wanted to go through some of the common insects you'll see um, in Alabama. The sequence of insects 
may differ from range from place to place. So uh, in many parts in Georgia, sometimes they have more squash bugs uh, than cucumber beetles. And in Alabama, we see more cucumber beetles in some years. And, um, and then of course, squash bugs is kind of a mid season. But cucumber beetles probably are going to be our first pest, you'll see. Uh, and they will jump on the, to the plants right when they're young. And they will start feeding on the leaves. There are multiple species. There are only two that you can see on your screen. That's the uh, spotted cucumber beetle with those spots on the top right of your screen, and then the striped cucumber beetle. Uh, and they will, they will feed together. They both transmit bacterial world. Uh, they will fly as you try to approach them. So you have to kind of approach cautiously, but they, they will fly out of the canopy and settle down. They take very short flights and they settle down. Uh, so uh, they're easy to spot and they shatter the leaves uh, like you see in the picture. Um, there are multiple generations and they all spread uh, the, the, the bacteria manually by chewing. Squash bugs that I think nobody likes um, is uh, another notorious pest, especially because it has, um, it contributes to the transmission of yellow vine decline disease. And that yellow vine decline disease has increased in Alabama. And um, it kind of uh, gets producers and gardeners off guard because uh, it shows up, um, where the insect shows up mid season and then late in the season close to harvest, your plants just quit. And that's a tragic end to your, the crop. So uh, squash bugs are very effective vectors. Uh, I'm not sure how many squash bugs are needed uh, to transmit the, that disease. I believe that's a bacterial disease, uh, but not very many. So you have to be on alert for squash bugs. Um, David, I'm still getting uh, notifications on people coming in to the meetings. Hopefully you are able to see them. All right, so um, yeah, so squash bugs are a very common problem and they are very good at hiding. And that's a challenge, uh, whether you are a conventional producer or you are a home gardener or you're organic, uh, try to get the uh, chemicals um, or the products to where they're hiding is a challenge. And you can see the immature stage as well. So the immature stage are more grayish uh, with those wing stubs on the back. So. Uh, two very common insects. Um, squash bugs are kind of mid-season pests, um, and then they uh, keep uh, developing through many generations. Now I'm going to get into the borers because there is a borer complex, and it's very confusing sometimes to uh, tell these apart. But I'll try to go a bit slow here and then speed up. Squash vine borer is the uh, kind of the early season borer. Uh, the moth will stay start flying around this time as soon as it uh, gets warm outside. And these day flying moths, you know, typically moths fly at night, but this is a day flying red color moth that looks like a wasp. So you may think it's very pretty and it's dancing, but it's not really dancing. It's laying eggs at the bottom of the plants. And uh, it'll lay these eggs and the, uh, it's, it's a very quick maneuver. And she'll keep on laying eggs at the plant bases the larva is kind of a creamish looking fat larva. It goes straight into the, into the vine and it stays there throughout its life, uh, except for pupation. So it'll come out when it needs to pupate. You will easily see this infestation late in the season when you see the excreta or the feces coming out of the hole uh, on, on the plant. So very classic, um, old pest, very established pest. And people are usually able to tell this one, especially once the plant is infested, but here's the next one that becomes very confusing. This is called the pickle worm. And if you plant, like I do, if I make the mistake as a gardener, I, I plant late some of my uh, Indian goats and pickle worms gets on them. So if you are planting late or you're succession planting and you have one of those uh, plantings in the, in the hot summer, uh, then pickle worms uh, becomes pretty heavy after a few generations. And uh, these pickle worms, they have, different uh, kind of greenish coloration, but they may or may not have the spots. Um, so as the larva matures, they lose the spots actually, but they're kind of this greenish looking larva and many of them would be on one uh, flower or in one fruit, you may see several and they will extensively tunnel uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the cucumbers. 
<clears throat> All right. Um, and then the last one that uh, usually gets very confusing uh, for many uh, beginning farmers and experienced ones is this insect, which is the melon worm. Uh, and the melon worm, the easiest way to identify is to look for the caterpillars. There will be several on the leaves or on the fruits. And they have this uh, two longitudinal lines on the back. So they're very visible from top. And uh, the other thing is what, if you have a bad infestation, you will see webbing on the leaves or the fruits. Uh, almost none of the others produce any webbing. So that's a pretty classic uh, indicator that you have melon worms. And again, that's a pest that likes the late planted crop and they can devastate that crop. So, and again, very difficult to control with organic insecticides. Um, you just, uh, it seems like if you plant too late, you have to fight the battle uh, head on with these insects. I will talk about this a little bit more. And this is by the way, on the blog article that I have linked to. So hopefully um, uh, you can click the link and see. There are several aphid species that can also uh, get on the cucurbits, especially the melon aphid, which is on the bottom of the picture, uh, bottom of the slide here in front of you. Uh, it's one of those that produces uh, alate or winged adults. So the adults fly to their host and once they settle down, they will lose those wings and they start breeding. And essentially aphids are cloning, cloning machines. They clone themselves. So they're very effective in uh, generating large number, uh, large numbers in a very short time. And, and they love it, uh, not too hot, but mild weather. So mild, cool summers with lots of rain is very good for aphids. Um, so just kind of be on the watch out. Um, I also have a picture of the aphid mummies on your screen. That's on the right of your screen. If you see them, those are uh, aphids infested with parasitoid. Leave them alone. Those are dead aphids. Their bodies are so swollen, so they're, they're called mummies. But um, uh, again, there are so many species and aphids get very confusing to identify. Try to take good pictures if you suspect it's aphid. Take good, steady pictures with your iPhone or whatever device you have and send, send them. Uh, also, some of the other pests, try to take multiple pictures from different angles, uh, especially sting bugs or squash bugs. It gets tricky uh, to tell them apart from some of the other species. Uh, I know um, Andre mentioned about white flies. I'm no expert on white flies. I usually don't get as much white flies. We have a very low population in our research plots, but I know in uh, Southeast part of the state where Andre uh, has started some research, uh, there is a heavy population of white flies and Georgia has these, um, I believe insecticide resistance, uh, resistance white fly species uh, that get really bad and it's a constant battle for those uh, farmers uh, down there. So be on the lookout. Uh, those pictures are, are many times uh, bigger, but they're actually tiny insects. They almost look like dust particles. When I, If you go through an infested field and walk through it, it seems like the dust particles go up. There's like a cloud of white dust, and then they settle back on the crop. You may have also seen them on ornamentals, uh, different species though. But you, if you have any experience, you can tell uh, white flies. The worst part about white flies is they transmit a number of uh, viruses, which once the plant gets the virus, there's no going back. So insect control is your option uh, to control the virus or shift to uh, tolerant or resistant varieties if there are any. Uh, so it's a, it's a constant research in progress. And uh, you have to be very cautious not to induce them with pesticides. That's one of the worst thing you can do is overuse insecticides and then get white flies. Then they're really difficult to control. Uh, so, but there are these two species that uh, look slightly different. Um, you can tell the, the silver leaf white fly, which is on the right of the screen, that's a major one um, that has, that kind of holds its wings uh, in V shape or like a roof of a house. Um, and then the other one, the greenhouse white fly is more flattened, uh, but they're both tiny insects. Uh, especially under underside of leaves, they will they will uh, survive on the underside of leaves and lay eggs, and those will hatch into nymphs. So uh, be on the lookout of these. And if you don't know about viruses, make sure you submit a sample. They are very difficult to tell from just pictures 
so make sure you send samples to your extension office or extension agent. And just because there are so many gardeners on, on this call, I thought I would show you what I do. I'm a constant gardener for goats. I go, I grow about eight different varieties of uh, uh, goats uh, from India. And you can see some of them on here. It's a very complicated picture, but uh, I have a very basic trellis. And, and one of the worst thing I've done is, and I'm telling you intentionally the mistakes you make is uh, putting too many things at one spot and then you're choking the plant because now you have hot spots where insects uh, will just uh, will flourish. There are lots of hiding spaces. So one of the things you need to look at is how you're growing it, how you're trellising it. I love trellises, but this is not the best one I've built. Um, so be on the, uh, just know that, you know, it's very important to, when you're a home gardener, how you're cultivating and producing the crop. Um, and even small farmers are doing it now uh, and selling it to special markets. So there's a, a good bunch of stuff you can do. Uh, and interestingly, these uh, insects uh, we went through will also attack these, these exotic vegetables. So they don't see any difference. So uh, here is pickleworm damage on ridge gourd. Uh, and you can see the ridge gourd uh, on the picture on the top left. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful fruit, but it can be completely infested with pickle worms, very frustrating. And here's uh, Indian cucumber. It's a very prolific variety that I grow. And, um, uh, but it's, you can, as you can tell, it's eaten up with pickle worm damage, that extensive tunneling. So it's really frustrating at, at times. Um, so you have to learn to manage it. I know Andre mentioned about uh, weather or uh, the weather systems. I wanted to kind of tell you based on our uh, monitoring insect monitoring project for last 10 years, uh, we have seen and recorded ups and down in, uh, in, in our weather patterns. And it seems like it's always shifting between drought and flood. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen in 2022, but uh, remember the flash drought and, the, and these, the, the prolonged drought. So there's two types of drought. These are very damaging to our crops. Uh, the plants get stressed and the insects just attack. Um, insects also take advantage of uh, the extra heat so they develop faster. And if you are a high tunnel producer with one of those covered areas, you have another challenge because you have longer crops and faster generation of insects that can breed inside the high tunnel. So um, just pay attention to the weather systems and plan your IPM strategy accordingly, okay? So that's the point I'm trying to make. And especially the flash drought uh, did a major damage uh, to my crop in 2019 on my tomatoes. So uh, be on the lookout uh, and, and monitor the weather uh, and keep good records. None of this can happen if you're not uh, taking good records. So again, IPM, Integrated Pest Management, you may have heard this a hundred times, but all it is is it's a decision management system it has many different steps. As you can see, it starts from the basic insect detection and monitoring, and then ends in making a treatment decision. Now, doing nothing is also a decision. So it's okay not to do, not to spray. And I always caution uh, gardeners and farmers that be very, very cautious of how you're spraying because you don't want to destroy your natural enemies. Uh, so I keep meticulous record for my research projects as well as my garden. I have a, a journal that's almost 11 years of gardening in, in Alabama. So um, you need to have good records and make a good decision based on your experience. Uh, you may read a lot of literature, um, but again, go back to your experience uh, on, on what how much insects you can tolerate. And when we talk about control, again, going back to that slide chart, uh, you can see the slide chart on the right, but this is how I kind of want you to think about insect control uh, or IPM. And I use this slide again and again and keep reminding people um, to think logically when you see insect problems. For example, the first level of, uh, uh, the, there are three levels of pest management. The first is called systems-based practices. And I'll take you a little bit deeper into it. Uh, the second level is pest exclusion or manual removal. And then the third, if needed, are insecticides. And depends on what is your choice, conventional or biorational insecticide, which is the 
uh, the uh, environment friendly versions. Um, and I do research on both, so I kind of enjoy the conversation on both sides. Uh, again, be very careful about uh, natural enemies. Don't spray them directly. Uh, count them in, look at their activity, and then make a decision. Also, try to rotate insecticides, organic or conventional, doesn't matter, uh, to prevent insecticide resistance. Another thing I will mention is those level one and level two are your pest prevention strategies. And those are what I'm going to emphasize today. Um, and level three, the insecticide is of course the therapeutic version. So when everything else fails, you have to use insecticides as your last tool. Uh, so uh, prevention versus therapeutic, just remember and think through these very carefully uh, as you do your gardening or production. And um, Again, I always say that you know not everything is meant for everybody. So I kind of divided these three levels of pest management that you saw into these smaller packages, depending on who you are. If you are an open field producer um, and you want to be sustainable, organic, natural type person, uh, then you can use trap crops and insecticides. If you're a high tunnel producer, we're doing a number of studies on the permanent pest exclusion system. And I have a picture on your screen. Hopefully you can see it. Um, and then if you're a small farmer market gardener, then you can use the temporary systems. And again, there's a lot of good literature now uh, that you can read online. Uh, but please check back with me or an agent to when you are designing these systems, because some of these systems like the uh, pest exclusion system, they're wonderful, but they can also backfire and you can lose crop. Uh, especially under our hot, humid conditions in Alabama. So pay close attention. That's why we do the research to tell you what not to do. So I have a list of not to do, a long list of not to do. So um, anyway, just kind of think through this. Uh, again, you can, you know, in the archive, you can uh, look back at the video and go through it again. Uh, and I think Harley is going to uh, post it in smaller uh, segments. So you'll be able to revise this slide uh, just quickly talking about the trap cropping, which is a level one control method. And uh, I have some good uh, publication in Southern SARE. Uh, that's the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program by USDA. It's a wonderful program for organic small farmers, uh, sustainable ag. Um, so you can go to their library, the National Library, and dig up these uh, articles in multiple languages. And also our blog articles that I have linked to you can click on the top and change the language. Uh, so you can read these publications in many different languages. Um, and if you have any problem, just reach back out to us and we'll try to help you. Uh, but these publications are online, which is great. Now, uh, this is a very kind of a basic talk on trap cropping. And last week in the tomato session, I talked about trap cropping in tomatoes. And that's the most advanced system that we have because it has moved from student research to uh, more demonstration style. This is what you're gonna watch now is more of a research phase uh, with trap crop. I'm still trying to learn and understand and analyze data to, to uh, tell you what's going on. But uh, we, have, um, been, we have tested many different crops as uh, alternative hosts or attractive hosts for cucumber beetles and squash bugs. And the one that we have found most effective that still stands out are these Hubbard squash, which is a winter squash with these gigantic fruits. So the fruits are almost the size of soccer ball. And uh, the great thing is that's actually an edible squash. So um, I tell farmers that you can actually sell this and uh, recover your cost of trap cropping. So, but trap crop basically is a sacrificial crop and you plant them on minimum number of rows. So here you see them on the outside rows and um, uh, they're, they're planted there uh, about two to three weeks ahead of the main crop. And uh, the two varieties we have found very effective is the baby blue and New England. And I'll show you some more. Now the seed sources have changed. You see the seed sources on your screen. Those have changed over the years. So. Uh, again, try, trying to find seed is sometimes difficult also, as I have found out, uh, you doing this for a long time now. And then you have the crops, the, sorry, if I go back, you have the yellow squash, 
which is your main crop in the middle. So again, um, this is kind of our, our early beginning research uh, into this system. And as I said, uh, we have been trying to tell farmers to grow it. Uh, they can actually grow it and some have, and you can cut open the fruit and show the nice yellow uh, uh, flesh inside. And, and a lot of the, uh, pop, you know, uh, the ethnic population, they, they love to see this because it resembles uh, pumpkins in other countries. So it's a very edible trap crop. And this is what the, uh, the insects do to the trap crop. So on the left of your screen, so both all these pictures are of the same day. And when you have a very bad outbreak of cucumber beetles, as we saw in 2015, you can see the leaf feeding on the left. And of course, along with leaf feeding comes the bacterial wilt, the disease that is transmitted. So um, the Hubbard really takes on, it establishes really quickly and uh, if it's not too wet, it does really well. And uh, if you provide a drip irrigation, it really jumps out and starts growing. It's a very fast growing uh, plant. And these were planted on the outside rows and it's protecting the yellow squash, the destiny yellow squash. So you can see the same day pictures and the quality of those uh, crops on the pictures that tells you what's going on. So again, um, it's amazing to see Hubbard uh, take on and be so attractive. Uh, and it'll keep growing. Here's squash bug. Uh, if you want to see that squash bug female in action, you have to go to my YouTube video and you'll be able to actually see that female laying eggs. And it's really remarkable. She would not fly away. She, they, they stay on and lay eggs. Uh, and then they hatch into these nymphs, um, which is on the second picture uh, on the right. So uh, again, tremendous numbers will build up on these Hubbard trap crop and they will not uh, migrate into the main crop. And the whole point is we're trying to reduce our spraying of the main crop and grow a crop uh, that's as insecticide free as it can be. So, and I'll show you some pictures of, of what we have done. Uh, now, this is not truly organic production system because we do use some of the conventional fertilizers. Uh, we, some years, like last year, we had too much disease. We had to use uh, fungicides to keep the plants alive but we exclude the insecticide, which, is, which can be very expensive. And this is what the squash bugs can do to Hubbard. You saw the good picture of the Hubbard. Here's her deflated fruits, uh, fruit of the Hubbard trap crop. Even after the vines are gone, the fruit is still attractive and hundreds of these squash bugs will hover over and under uh, these fruits. So uh, again, it's really remarkable to see this. And, it, and in the meantime, your yellow squash is still protected. Uh, and the idea is to get out of production and harvest it timely so that you don't have to kill, uh, use too much insecticide on your main crop. So that's the whole idea. This is long-term savings. Uh, just to show you some pretty complicated research here, but <clears throat> what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the area in uh, trap crop because the Hubbard takes up a lot of space. So our goal is to reduce the area and get maximum benefit. So what we have done is we've tried to shrink the uh, Hubbard squash area to the minimum we can. And this is again, after many, many years of observations, we have developed this and then putting the trap crop on both sides of the yellow squash. So this is a pretty sizable uh, experiment uh, on a big acre, almost takes up a total of about one acre or a little bit more than that. <clears throat> but <clears throat> Again, this is kind of a work in progress. Um, and you can see the, uh, the crops, the two different types of varieties uh, of trap crops. And this is what it looks in reality. Uh, so you're looking at the yellow squash in the middle and then uh, look at that Hubbard, beautiful crop of Hubbard. Uh, again, if you stand there for too long, uh, those plants will go up your knees. So they are, they're like kudzu. Uh, they're amazing if you have a good year. Um, and they function really well as a trap crop. And you can see how close they are. And even with that, th that closeness is important to the main crop. You go too far out, you lose the, uh, the effectiveness. And this is what happened. I know this is a lot of data here, but what I'm not trying to show is, if you have noticed the numbers of eggs on the Hubbard, 
uh, the baby blue and New England. As long as you have good trap crop, the trap crop takes on the abuse and they have majority of the eggs and the adults. Go to the right of your screen. Those are the plants, uh, especially the top one, where the plants are right close to the uh, trap crop. And that has much less egg load compared to the others. Now, as you go further away from the trap crop, your numbers go up again. So that's what I'm trying to tell you here is you, the challenge with trap cropping is you got to need space. You have to plant early and close to, your, to the crop that you're trying to protect because it's a, it's, it doesn't have a height difference. It's a visual. The insects are attracted to it visually. So you have to make the plants obvious, um, the Hubbards. And then um, you, we did not do any insecticide treatment. This is 2020, but we use uh, dinotiferon, which is scorpion, one of the most expensive chemistry you can buy for squash bugs. And you can kill, you can wipe out squash bugs like crazy. So uh, very timely applications can help tremendously uh, on farming scale. Uh, this is from 2018. So I, I have uh, these slides mixed up, but same thing. The further away you go from the main, uh, from the trap crop, you have more squash bugs. So the trap crop, uh, a good functioning trap crop has tremendous benefits. And this time we use, if you look at the middle of the screen, bottom and, and the red letters, it mentions pygenic and entrust. Those are your organic uh, products. Again, we don't get a very good kill with organic products because squash bugs are very difficult to kill. You have to target the nymphs to kill them. So with organic treatments, it's, it's difficult to kill them but the trap crop still holds them uh, in place. So you can, if you're organic, you can get your harvest done and move on. So overall, just to show you, um, it seems like in, <clears throat> I don't have a recommendation of just one trap crop. Uh, for example, just like plant New England, I would say try to plant both New England and baby blue because uh, some years we have stand issues. And uh, so we try to, uh, use both the varieties uh, of Hubbard uh, together and get a good result. Uh, and then there's some other things I've mentioned. For example, you know, trap cropping is like a it's, a, it's a pest prevention strategy and it can also be used as a attract and kill strategy. So you can use organic products or chemicals, uh, but target the nymphs. And when the insects are small, uh, low in numbers, uh, if you have an outbreak, it's going to be very difficult. So again, weather has a huge influence on these insects. So remember, every year it seems to be different. Uh, so watch out for the populations and make your decision. Um, moving on. So just to show you some pictures now, going after the data, here's the pictures. So that's the wonderful inside flesh of the Hubbard squash. Uh, I don't know what's that. Uh, but, uh, oh, that's my... <laughs> But uh, the Hubbard squash is a uh, is a marketable trap crop, um, and you can see the insecticide-free yellow squash. Last year, I actually tried watermelons, uh, so I tried different designs, and we grew watermelons uh, alongside the yellow squash. And then you can see the trap crop. Um, some of the I think the baby blue did not do well last year. I cannot explain why, but. Um, they did bear fruit, um, just different sizes. But you're looking at the insecticide-free main crop there on your screen. So it's pretty impressive uh, what's going on. And you can see some Facebook videos I've posted on the IPM channel. Just quickly about pest exclusion systems. Sorry, I'm going up, uh, going a little bit faster so that I can finish on time, but I will take questions. So again, if you're talking about uh, pest exclusion systems, I have some publications on high tunnel pest exclusion system. Uh, I'll show you a few slides very quickly, but exclusion systems, I think, offer a very good uh, strategy to our farmers, especially if you are a small producer, market gardener, uh, trying to sell at the farmer's markets. I think this is worth try. And depending on how much you want to invest, uh, you can have good returns on investment and, uh, and use this as a prevention strategy. So pest exclusion is, again, a, a pest prevention strategy. Uh, it's not essentially a control strategy. And the idea is very simple, that you're trying to separate the 
insect from the plant and you stop giving access uh, to the plant. So, uh, and you can do it for short term or you can do it for the entire season. Uh, most of what I'm focusing on um, in some of the open field research I'm doing, it's the short term benefits. Um, but again, careful design is very important. Like I said, some of these techniques, if you don't plan them right, they can backfire and become a problem. So planning and experience is very important. And just to show you some examples, this is the temporary pest exclusion system. Uh, I do have a blog article on it and I forgot to link it. I'll try to do it on, on Facebook here uh, in a short while. But there is uh, the two systems. The temporary system is the low cost, cheaper version um, that you can do. There's many different designs and materials you can use. The ones that I have tested uh, most are the ones on your screen. It says under examples. So super light insect barrier, Agrofabric Pro. Um, there's also a Coverton Pro 19 and ProtectNet. ProtectNet is perhaps the most expensive net I have tested. Um, so that may not be very, uh, it's very good product, but expensive. So if you're a commercial farmer, think about these as your investments, not as, an ex as your expense because you're gonna get a good, good product at the end, a uh, good crop. And um, I know Andre has done some research uh, on using exclusion systems for white flies using one of the fabric. Uh, but here's uh, one that we tried on a small scale uh, in central Alabama uh, with uh, U-shaped hoops, just PVC pipes. And uh, these were covered imme almost immediately after transplant. So we do not wait for the insect because once the insect comes in, it's like really difficult. The other drawback of this system is if you are growing, if you have been growing cucurbits for a long time in an area, it may actually trap the insects like squash vine borers, I can think, that live in the soil. And you, if you put the netting on and seal it, you can perhaps cause more problem. So that's something you have to decide depending on your location. Uh, but then remove the netting. So once the blooming starts, because you need the pollinators and you don't want it to be hot because fruits can be aborted uh, if it gets too hot. So remove the netting um, once the flowering starts or as soon as the plants start to touch the netting. The idea is by then you will probably uh, deflect a lot of your vine borers and a lot of the other insects like aphids uh, away from the crop. So uh, again, this is not a foolproof system. Uh, it's a work in progress, but I'm giving you some ideas to think of. And we have done more research on this on the with tomatoes. Uh, I have much more research data on exclusion in tomatoes and cowpeas or beans. Uh, one, some of the advantages of these is besides insect control is they can also raise the temperature. Um, so if you are trying to plant early, like I know some tomato producers go early uh, by covering it up with these, these are not row covers, but pest exclusion material, um, you can raise the temperature uh, and block the wind. So there are some side benefits to it. Uh, of course, it's more work. And then you can also use uh, 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 beneficial insects and let them feed inside uh, the, the netting. So, uh, there's lots of benefits. This is something we're doing with our high tunnel producers now that are trying exclusion systems. Quickly about the permanent system. Now in the temporary system, it's called temporary because it's a short season. You do it for some time, it's low cost. Most of the fabric is low cost. Contrast with that, this system, this is the permanent system where you are using uh, a shade cloth because it's cheapest but there are other things you can use, but the cheapest is shade cloth and using that to keep the bugs out of your high tunnels because high tunnels already provide a structure. It's much easier to work with high tunnels and exclusion system. And you're looking at one of my earliest studies in 2014 uh, on this hydroponic lettuce. And we were trying to stop, I know we are talking about cucurbits, but I just want to tell you the story. This was a bad army worm infestation in the high tunnel. And we were able to block 90% uh, of the pests, the army worms using the netting around the high tunnel. So that was the humble beginning of, uh, of uh, pest exclusion system. And now we have a number of farmers, almost 
17 locations, uh, majority of them in Alabama, but also Georgia and Florida, uh, where farmers are doing this and we're doing demonstrations. And you're looking at some very fine producers. Uh, and what you're looking at in the picture is uh, using the 50% shade cloth. And we use uh, these insect monitoring traps. And the ones you see on the ground uh, are the one side that looks very dirty. Those are the ones that are from the open field. Um, and the ones that were that are clean, those are the traps that are inside the netted tunnel. So you can see the visual difference uh, that how these traps are able to are, help us to quantify what we're stopping. But it's a significant drop in insect population, especially the large ones. It will not work for aphids and, and some of the other white flies. But if you're trying to grow any cucurbits inside uh, a high tunnel, you can give it a shot. Uh, this is a picture a couple of years back. Uh, yeah, 2020. Army worms. Again, last year was also a bad army worm year. But this picture was actually sent by one of the farmer who is participating in the exclusion study. And, and she was just horrified uh, when she saw these army worms trying to get in and they could not get in to the crop. Uh, and they're coming out of that grass and she's surrounded by hay and pasture. She has livestock. So uh, again, uh, tremendous, lots of success stories uh, on this technology and it, we still are working. I'm working with Andre to uh, look at some of the horticultural economic aspects of the pest exclusion system. We are also doing an economic analysis uh, with Jesse Boswell uh, to figure out the actual economics of this. But the 17 locations we have, none of the farmers have taken it down um, because they see tremendous benefit of, of start using the exclusion system. So oh, again, this is for high uh, producers, not so much home gardeners. And now you're looking at an aggregate of last four years from 17 to 2020. Uh, again, a tremendous drop in number of insects with, uh, with using exclusion system and it will slow down squash vine borers, and we have also seen it slow down squash bugs. It just takes them time to colonize uh, because that fabric stops them or delays the infestation. So again, giving some ideas um, as I close out. So overall, again, no, I know. Uh, this is a system very good for beginning farmers. Um, and we are kind of learning from farmers directly by doing these studies on farm. Um, before COVID, they were cost effective. The cost of material has gone up recently uh, post COVID. So that's, uh, that's something we're dealing with, um, the supply shortage issues. And uh, again, this is not foolproof. You still have to deal with aphids, white flies, thrips that go in. But with these producers, with the exclusion system, now it has opened the door for using biologicals. So you can use natural enemies, biologicals to, uh, to help you further. Overall, uh, I know this is a big busy slide, but uh, hopefully you can come back to it later. But I have tried to think through some of the, um, some of the most common IPM recommendations for these insects. For example, key corn beetles, level one and level two, you know, those are the pest prevention tactics. So using trap crops, using cover crops, uh, cover crops seemingly confuse the beetles. Uh, weed control, very important. Sanitation and weed control is very important in cucurbit production. Uh, you have too much weeds, you can have uh, uh, more of these white flies, aphids, and beetles uh, on, those, on those weeds, and they will move on to your crop. Uh, I have a column on vine borers and melon worms. And again, you're seeing sanitation is a very important cultural practice. Um, and then I have a question mark on trap crop because I don't have consistent data. Uh, also, uh, bioinsecticides, very difficult to use bioinsecticides for these vine borers, melon worms. You may use some of the chemicals uh, to, like some of the synthetic pyrethroids if you are conventional, and use it like a lay-by treatment. So you have to spray ahead of the insect. And as the insect starts to come out and lay eggs, and the female touches the plant, and picks up the toxin, she dies from it. Uh, so that's a lay-by treatment uh, sort of, but uh, very difficult to control these borers. You have to use varieties, look at varieties, uh, manage your planting time. Don't plant too late into the summer. 
uh, because then you get eaten up with these vine borers and different borers. Um, and then uh, give give your pest exclusion a try if you're going to, if you want to try it. These are fairly easy to get from uh, Amazon.com, Arbico, Organics, different websites. With that, I'm going to close out. I think I have maybe four five minutes to take questions and look at the chat. I see the chat moving here um, and I have coffee in my hand so I can still uh, answer the questions. But uh, I've written some of the highlights uh, that you should remember, uh, especially there's no shortcut to scouting. Uh, you have to scout the crops. Uh, there's nothing automatic about this. Uh, it's hard work and field work. Uh, and protect natural enemies and try to integrate these different strategies. Uh, I did not talk about the insecticide part. If you are interested in insecticides, give me a call or look at the tomato session. And we went into more details in that. Uh, so I didn't want, didn't want to repeat myself, keep my on time. But with that, I am going to uh, perhaps stop this.